A bit of risk aversion building right here from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Yields lower, Treasury's bid, equities down eight tenths of one percent. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue, geopolitical jitters. People are feeling nervous. Just general tolerance for risk is definitely muted right now. Particularly with the, the Ukraine headlines. We're dealing with geopolitical risk. The geopolitical risk around Russia and Ukraine. Replacing COVID as our sort of worry du jour. The Russian-Ukraine hostilities. It's hard for the markets to read. If Russia does invade Ukraine, 50 bips is completely off the table. Another reason why the Fed's going to be very, very careful heading into, into March. As a geopolitical hedge. I actually do like treasuries uh, in here. Anything can derail this Fed. Any sort of serious escalation. If we do see more tensions. All better off if there's actually uh, action. Team coverage starts right here. Let's head down to DC and catch up with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, very difficult, complex to keep up with these headlines. Incredibly difficult on what's going now, Jonathan. I think we should um, really just parse it in terms of what is happening on the ground and also what's happening on the diplomatic front. So on the ground, what we heard from a U.S. official last night briefing reporters is that the Kremlin saying that they are pulling back troops. They said that is false. And actually what they see is a troop buildup, actually more of 7,000 added to what already was there. And the president put that 150,000. You know, the U.K. defense minister backing that assessment today. The Kremlin says that that is wrong. Wrong. Then on the diplomatic front, Jonathan, just in the past 30 minutes or so, we're seeing a flurry of diplomacy, one that is potentially impacting the financial markets, is a report out of Russian media. And this is a report that the deputy U.S. ambassador was expelled by Russia. This just shows a deterioration in the diplomacy. And then uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on his way to the Munich Security Council in Europe. And before that, Jonathan, he's going to be stopping at the United Nations. And we have this information from the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. And what she said out to the public in a tweet is Secretary Blinken is coming to New York on his way to Munich to signal our intense commitment to diplomacy, to offer and emphasize the path toward de-escalation, and to make it clear to the world that we are doing everything we can to prevent war, Jonathan. AMH, let's go through this piece by piece together, point by point, where the dispute is at the moment. We've got claims and counterclaims. The claim from yes. Russia is that they are withdrawing troops. The claim from the U.S. is that they're building them up. That's the big dispute at the moment. Overnight, there was another dispute as well. The Russian-backed separatists claimed Ukrainian forces violated a ceasefire agreement in five places overnight. Now, I haven't seen verification from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. They didn't immediately mm -hmm. verify that. And another additional issue here is, Anne-Marie, it's not exactly unusual over the last seven years for no. these things to happen. Well, I think that's exactly right, Jonathan. And you hit the nail on the head saying this is not unusual. There has been fighting for almost a decade, as you say, seven years in eastern Ukraine, particularly in Luhansk and Donetsk. And what you saw overnight is both sides claiming the other side broke the ceasefire agreement, the Minsk Accord. And we have yet to see the verification on what side it is. But we should note, Jonathan, the issue right now is while this particularly is not anything new, if you've been following what's been going on in eastern Ukraine for the past few years, but given the high attention to this region right now and what is going on, the worry is that potentially what is usually very unusual usual because there's so much fighting there that this could become a mishap and a stumble into something and escalate into something that's far bigger. AMH, stay close. I want to turn to Brussels and catch up with Maria Tadeo. Maria, you've been following a series of addresses taking place in Brussels, one from the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, another from the US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. What we hear from the Russians is there is no Ukraine invasion. We're not planning for one. What we hear from the Americans, from the US envoy to the UN, evidence on the ground is that Russia is moving towards an imminent invasion. That's the quote from her in the last hour. Put it all together for us. 
Well, Jonathan, when you look at the European take on this, which is usually where they meet in the middle, what they say is that they do not see significant de-escalation. That is not what they're seeing right now. What they are seeing, however, is that overnight there was a shelling of a school in eastern Ukraine. They are seeing huge misinformation coming out of Russia, and they also say that moving tanks around, that doesn't mean you're pulling back. This is, again, and we need to explain the technicalities of this. When you have a huge deployment like the one that Russia has along Ukraine, but also along Belarus, you can move troops around, but it does not mean that they're heading back to Russia. The other issue is what they do with the ammunition, the weapon, and not the heavy artillery that they have. If that stays in place, Jonathan, in real terms, that is not de-escalation, because what it means is that you pull the men back, but in two, three weeks' time, they could be ready to attack again. And that is what the European Union says today, that they are not seeing any meaningful uh, de-escalation from the Russians. And by the way, I spoke to a very senior official, and I asked him, what about the European sanctions? H how can you get this happening? You need 27 countries to agree, and you need unanimity. That is a technicality, is a word. And he told me, I've spoken with the 27. That is not going to be a problem. As soon as Russia invades, there will be a package of sanctions against Russia. Maria, it's really important what you just said, unity. Just how united the message seems to be right now. I felt it, you have too. Every time someone from NATO speaks at the moment, they're all saying the same thing. How important is that? It's incredibly important because you remember at the start of this crisis, the concern was that Vladimir Putin, who has been in government and in power for a very long time, was going to try to divide and conquer. That was the principle that he was going to divide the UK and the US, put them on a different track separate to that of the Europeans, that he was going to tap into Germany in particular. That was seen as a weak link. But I also uh, spoke to Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor today, and he repeats there will be serious sanctions if Russia invades Ukraine. There is no question when you speak to Western European countries, also the Eastern European countries, in a very long time, I hadn't seen them saying the same talking points. You know, we're all united against this. So, frankly, I'm surprised to see this level of unity. Usually, this is not the case in Europe. We know it's very difficult to get the 27 around the table. But what they perceive right now, this is really the key, is a foreign threat to the union. And that's when they get united. And Marie, just want to give you the final word. Secretary Blinken making a previously unscheduled stop now to the UN a little bit later this morning. We'll hear from him in about 54 minutes time. Then he goes on to Munich. We've heard a lot from Russia. We've heard a lot from the United States. We've heard a lot from NATO. MH, what are we hearing from Ukraine? Because for a lot of people, what they hear are some really strong, forceful words from NATO, the Secretary General, some really strong, forceful words from Secretary Blinken and others. What they haven't heard is a similar tone from Ukraine, or for that matter, of course, from Russia, who continue to deny any plan of going into Ukraine. What do you make of that? It's a very difficult position right now the Ukrainians are in, and for two reasons. One, they will say that we have dealt with this for years. There has been fighting in their eastern region. There was, of course, the 2014 annexation of Crimea. For them, this is an everyday occurrence. And you can even see sometimes, Jonathan, on their Twitter account, they troll what it's like to live next door to this quote-unquote neighbor of theirs and how it's a difficult neighbor. The second is, Jonathan, is that Ukraine is, of course, still struggling as an economy. And what is so precarious and hard for them to deal with is what we already are seeing, which is billionaires and oligarchs in Ukraine, businessmen and women, leaving the country. What is so could be so worrisome for Ukraine is that, say, Russia does not actually invade, but decides to drag its feet on a withdrawal and a pullback and just keeps troops there for a while. What does that do to the Ukrainian economy? What does that do to tourism? This is potentially something that could hurt their economy tremendously. And this is why they have been trying to quell some of the uh, some of the nerves happening from the West onto Kiev. And you saw that for President Zelensky in a very tongue-in-cheek speech talking about this just this week. And then when it was translated into English, it didn't make a lot of sense to English speakers about how this is how he communicates. But this is why he is doing it this way. They are trying to make sure that there's not panic on the ground, especially when it comes to a capital drain in the country. The sarcasm is lost on algos, apparently. AMH, stay close. A lot to work through through the following gown. Maria today, thank you. Joining us from Brussels, let's reset. Your equity market's lower by about seven tenths of one percent. Not a major move going into the opening bell about 20 minutes away. Yields are backing off a bit. They come in four basis points on tens to 199. Twos come in two basis points. Just a little break of 150 at the front end at 149. Great panel to work through some of these issues as we get towards the open. Joining us now, Morgan Stanley's Jim Karen, Academy's Peter Cheer, Laurie Cavasina of RBC Capital. Peter, I want to come first to you. 
You work for a very original company. You're surrounded by generals. This is work you do every single day. What are they saying, Pete, to you at the moment? So for the past three weeks, we've really been neck and neck between some sort of negotiated stand down and a limited incursion. So first, we really don't see an attack of Kiev or a full scale invasion. So that's really still off the table as far as we see it. And we see this back and forth, whether it's limited incursion. So the Donetsk region, the Donbass, if he takes that, or we get some sort of you know ultimate settlement. Right now, I think we're leaning slightly more that he wants this limited incursion. The, real, the thing that he really needs to show back home is how powerful he is, and nothing says that like getting land. On the other hand, if he gets a strong enough negotiated settlement, we might see that. And I think you made some great points in the previous segment talking about how NATO does seem to be coalescing, because he is trying to fracture NATO a little bit, and he's trying to find those fissures and put pressure on them. And it looked for a little while it was cracking. We seem to be coalescing. So that's going to be really important, and I think that's going to drive the shape of any settlement and what the economy looks like afterwards. Pete, when you sit down around the table with the generals that work for Academy and you blend in the market conversation, what do you think is lost at the moment? As you put on networks like this, one watch programs like this, you read through the research on the South Side, what do you think is missing? So I think there's sometimes not enough dialogue. So we look at how Putin has behaved in the past. So one thing we explore is Georgia. He went in very quick. Crimea, even our generals will say it was excellently executed. They didn't like it, but he, what he did there was perfect, very quick. So why is he deviating from this so much, right? This has been a very long and drawn out process, which isn't like him. On the other hand, I think we've done a very good job of explaining the false flag techniques that he likes. And, you know, all this potentially shelling, these treating breaks. We've been, I think, ahead of him this time saying this is his likely path. And his ideal world, I think our scenario was three weeks ago, he does a limited incursion, quickly throws up his hand, says, hey, I got what I wanted. I wanted to support these Russian people. They've offered 700,000 Russian citizenship in that region. And then he's done. He gets a quick settlement with Europe. I think that's getting harder and harder for him to do. So the good part is it's been pushing back on the likelihood of incursion. The bad part of this, though, is we get an incursion. I think it's going to be a little bit more drawn out in terms of friction and sanctions and disruption to the markets. Laurie, you're very focused on this, too, I know as well. Let's work through the issues together. One, energy. Two, supply chains. Three, recession risk in Europe. What's top of the pile for you at the moment? So, look, I would say, you know, among everything that Peter just said, sanctions um, was the thing that worried me the most, but perhaps markets have been most focused on energy prices. And I think, you know, I, I think all three of those that you mentioned, John, frankly, are top of mind. We just did a survey of our analysts and we said, how does this matter to the industries you cover? What issues are relevant? And those were the three that they picked far above any sort of, you know, kind of impact or erosion to sentiment. And frankly, above kind of the, the non-energy commodities, things like titanium, aluminum, things that are taking up a lot of the conversation are perhaps a little bit less relevant to stocks and the stock market itself. I would tell you, I think energy and the general inflation picture is probably uh, the number one factor here. There's a thread there. It runs through a lot of different issues. It ends up impacting the economic outlook. Um, I had one of my analysts tell me that he's worried about the rise in energy prices. He covers financials, um, but he's, he's concerned about the rise in energy prices that might emanate because it could stoke inflation and make the Fed act even more aggressive, make the Fed act even more hawkish. Um, so that's the kind of thread the market is pulling on right now. This is a big air pocket of uncertainty. Markets know that this is not good, but they're struggling to connect the dots and really understand how bad this is. That final point, though, is so important. Jim, if we can just tee up the next segment on that, what this means for the Fed. I can hear people that are saying it means the Fed would back away. I hear people saying it will mean the Fed will have to do more. That's what Laurie's leaning into. Jim, how do you think this would influence the Fed? And I'm not asking you to get a crystal ball for geopolitics. No one's asking you to do that today. I just want to understand how various scenarios shape what the Fed's going to do and what it's not going to do? Well, I, I think it's a matter of sequencing, right? So in the first stages, if there is an invasion and there is a lot of uncertainty and volatility around that, then I think that that's going to hurt global growth. Yes, energy prices are going to go up. That's also going to be inflationary. But there's also going to be a lot of demand destruction, and that's going to slow GDP growth uh, you know, going, going forward. Now, as this plays through, what we've typically seen in these types of events is that when energy prices do continue to stay high, this could cause more inflation. So now the Fed's in a real pickle. Right now you have growth that may be slowing down on a global perspective and certainly domestically in, in the U.S. could be. 
and they also have a higher inflation problem. So then they have like a, a stagflation or what they call the misery index, where you get low growth and high inflation. The Fed still has to fight the high inflation, but they don't want to do it too much because they don't want to kill growth or, or further weaken growth. So this becomes a really, really volatile situation, very, very hard to model, very, very hard to invest through. But I think what we need to do is really start to think about where value actually is in the markets and position yourself in a way that you're right-sized so that you can endure the volatility because these types of events do have a start date and an end date and once it gets priced the markets tend to settle a bit it's a really tough moment jim Cameron is going to stick with us alongside peter chair and laurie calvacina a fantastic panel to work through some of these issues going into the opening bell up next on the program pricing in more fed hikes my guess is that by the end of this year we're not going to be back to our two percent target by the end of this year but by the end of this year we should be well on our way back towards that. That conversation up next. If we raise rates really aggressively, we run the risk of slamming the brakes on the economy, putting the economy into recession. My caution to my colleagues and to myself is let's not overdo it. The view from Neil Kashkari, as you might expect from the Minneapolis Fed president, tons to work through. We're down six tenths of one percent on the S&P going into the opening bell. Some reports at the moment, I stress reports, this from AP, that Russia has expelled the deputy chief of U.S. diplomatic mission in Moscow. That's come from the Associated Press from AP just moments ago. Futures down about six tenths of one percent. We have to turn our attention to the Fed as well. The minutes failing to deliver the clarity on rate hikes that investors were perhaps hoping for. Here's the quote. If inflation does not move down as they expect, it would be appropriate for the committee to remove policy accommodation at a faster pace than they currently anticipate. On the story, here's Mike McKee. Well, John, this was a story of a dog that did not bark. Unlike the January Fed minutes release, there wasn't much in here for Wall Street to trade on. Uh, Jay Powell said most of it during his news conference after the meeting in January, uh, saying participants agreed uncertainty regarding the path of inflation was elevated and risks to inflation were weighted to the upside. Well, tell Wall Street something new. The closest they came to anything that might affect trading, because they didn't talk about, as you mentioned, the 50 basis points, they also agreed it was important for the committee to retain the flexibility to adjust to any of the details of its approach in light of changing economic, financial, uh, economic and financial conditions. But that was also in the statement of principles released after the meeting. So nothing really new here. The lack of a more hawkish tone and no specific discussion of a particular large move in March led investors to knock down the odds a little bit of a 50 basis point move and the yield curve steepened, but it did give it back today so far. The takeaway at this point uh, in this day and age of constant Fed speak, a three week old uh, rule, uh, list of minutes isn't going to move the markets very much on a normal basis. They'll tell us what policymakers were thinking, not what they're thinking is going to happen. A lot of data, a lot of Fed speak uh, between now and March 15th. Jim Vogel of FTN put it this way. Uh, we've taken the 50 basis point hike out of the conversation and put Ukraine back in. For them, maybe. For others, not so much. It was interesting yesterday, I might thank you, that J.P. Morgan actually moved their call. They went from five hikes to seven. We heard from Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management, who is looking for a 50 basis point hike in March. Matt Horn, back of Morgan Stanley, who thinks we need one. I want to get to the panel on this. Laurie Cavacina. I guess I'm trying to work out whether we've seen peak hawkishness on the rate side of the story of this Fed. Do you think we have? Well, look, I think on the equity market side, we've basically priced in the average Fed uh, hiking cycle. And what I mean by that is if you go back to the 1990s, um, you've had an average 16 percent contraction in the P.E. multiple from the kind of high around when hiking starts to the trough in the middle of the hiking cycle. And we did a 17 and a half percent contraction on January 27th, which was the day after that, you know, sort of uh, a famous now, I guess, press conference of Powell's. Um, so in my mind, the market has you know really digested the risks in terms of the multiple. Now, we've talked a lot about derivative impact. 
impacts today. I don't think that we've really priced in any economic damage that might come uh, from the Fed's increased hawkishness and increased aggression. So I think that's an issue we have to watch going forward. That's the source of potential further downside in markets. But if we're just talking about the Fed kind of cooling things off and, and tightening and being pretty aggressive about it, I actually do think that's in the equity market. And I think that's why the market has really not made a new low since that January 27th level. Jim, I know what you'll push back on, though. We're talking about rates. We're not talking about the balance sheet, are we? That's correct. I, I think the balance sheet will become a bigger feature going forward. But, you know, from, from, from yesterday's statement or from yesterday's minutes, I should say, that effectively what came out of the market was that it reduced the likelihood that there would be a 50 basis point rate, hard, uh, a rate hike to kick off the rate hiking cycle in March. Um, but that doesn't mean, though, that the market couldn't withstand it. It certainly could. I can see the logic for that to happen. But look, you know, effectively what the Fed is trying to do is raise interest rates to to effectively move from very easy and accommodative policies up to neutral and they're not actually really trying to tighten financial conditions at the moment. Now, the inflation trajectory is going to be very, very informative on this. The, the hope from the Fed is that inflation does start to come down in the second quarter, in the third quarter, and in, into the fourth quarter, and that they don't have to be as aggressive as maybe what some of the markets are actually pricing in. Now, the flip side of that is that if inflation doesn't come down, then effectively they have to move from just going to neutral to actually tight. And now we have to think about what the Fed does in 2023. So it's very well socialized, six or seven rate hikes this year. What happens in 2023? Is it one or two? Is it three or four? If it's three or four, that starts to signal the possibility for a more inverted yield curve and for the potential for there to be a recession you know, coming soon thereafter. Let's keep building on this conversation. Jim Caron, Laurie Cavacina, Peter Chair, with a ton to say on this as well. Just getting some headlines from the President of the United States, Joe Biden, speaking to reporters departing the White House on his way to Ohio. He says the following, reason to believe that Russia is involved in false flag moves. He says he has no plans to call his Russian counterpart, President Vladimir Putin. He goes on to say the probability of an invasion is, quote, very high. The Russians, of course, go on to deny any plans to invade Ukraine. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie around the opening bell as well. Coming up next, your morning calls and later, earnings from Walmart. Five minutes away from the opening bell. Equities pulling back just a little bit. We're down seven tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq right now, we're down eight tenths of one percent. That's the price action here. The morning calls. We begin first up with Cowan upgrading Yum Brands to outperform 143 price target, highlighting its compelling valuation and global growth prospects. Morgan Stanley downgrading 3M to underweight, seeing limited upside given the company's ongoing legal battles. And finally, J.P. Morgan downgrading CF Industries to neutral, forecasting a challenging year ahead amid continued volatility in energy prices. Coming up, Walmart topping earnings estimates despite consistent cost inflation and supply chain bottlenecks and the latest on Ukraine around the opening bell. That's next. This is not the kind of equity market that many people enjoy. Whipsawed by headlines, claims and counterclaims, and geopolitics. Futures right now down three quarters of 1% on the S&P. We're down almost 1% on the Nasdaq 100 on the Russell. We're down nine tenths of 1%. There's the opening bell, switch up the board. A bid into the bond market, yields lower by four or five basis points. A break to the downside of two, 199.45 on tens. Euro dollar just a touch weaker, no drama here, basically unchanged at 113.67. Crude backing away. This is an interesting one this morning. We're down by 2.63% at $91.16. Pleased to say that Bloomberg's Anne-Marie is staying close with us this morning down in D.C. Anne-Marie, the latest, please. The latest we have, Jonathan, is the president leaving the White House, departing, deciding to take a moment to speak to reporters, saying that the probability of a Russian invasion is, quote, very high. Those were her were his words. He's having the sense that an invasion can happen in the next several days and saying that every indication we have is that they are prepared to go into Ukraine. He also adds, likely, I imagine, a question from a reporter of whether or not he will pick up the phone to President Vladimir Putin. Right now, he says he has no plans, Jonathan, to do so. MH, that's the line from the president of the United States. You're familiar with the line from Russia. They say we've got no plans to invade Ukraine. You and I talked about this briefly about 20 minutes ago. I think it's worth going over again. 
What is the number one line coming out of Ukraine? So Ukraine is certainly in contact with all the Western allies and leaders. And while they agree that there is this uh, mass Russian troops around their borders, this is something they say that they have lived with for almost a decade, Jonathan, especially when you see a lot of, um, uh, you know, his almost hysteria, but worry about what is going on in eastern Ukraine this morning. You and I both pointed out that this is an everyday occurrence in the Donbass region, notably in Luhansk and Donetsk. And both you have the Kremlin backed separatists and the Ukrainian army saying the other side broke a ceasefire. The worry is what if that was, as the United States is talking about, potentially Russia having a false flag operation. And the worry is that what kind of action in East Ukraine could potentially grow and metastasize into something much bigger. For Ukraine, Jonathan, the issue they have is they want to make sure they quell any nerves because they are an economy that at the moment is a little bit on a shoestring, right? They are still trying to develop their economy. And already we've seen capital, businesses, oligarchs leave the country because they are concerned. And what they want to do is make sure they can maintain an economy because they're not sure how long this could last. Amory, we've heard from a lot of people this morning and we'll hear from Secretary Blinken in about 30 minutes to so the UN right here in New York. The line that came from Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, got my attention, it got yours. He used this phrase, a new normal, for European security. What did he mean by that? He means a new normal of what if Russia were to continue amassing troops and maybe not invading, but leaving those troops there. I mean, Russia does have billions, north of $600 billion of reserves in the bank. You have oil prices trekking towards $100 a barrel, which is certainly going to lift the ruble. These are things that right now is on the side of President Vladimir Putin in terms of uh, economically being able to withstand those troops out there. But something that Ukraine could not, Jonathan, this could potentially really drain the Ukrainian economy if this were to continue. And I think Jens Stoltenberg talking about this new normal is potentially this tit for tat between yeah. Russia and the West. And we should note, Jonathan, Russia has sent a letter with their proposals, Interfax is talking about, and one of those is about moving back those NATO forces. AMH, thank you. The president making comments just moments ago. We have some feedback of that at the moment. Let's listen back to this so-called tape playback. These are comments from the president just a few minutes earlier. The United Nations will make his statement today. He'll lay out what that path is. I've laid out a path to Putin as well uh, on, I think, Sunday. And so there is a path. There is a way through this. Are you, you going to call Putin? Putin? Will you speak to Putin Are you going to call Putin? I'm not calling Putin. I have no plans to call Putin you right you now. Have you, have you made a final decision first? The President of the United States making comments to reporters as he departs the White House to head to Ohio. The next comments we expect from the administration in about 25 minutes' time. We'll hear from Secretary Blinken at the UN here in New York on his way to Munich. In about 10 minutes' time, we'll catch up, touch base with Anne Marie again down in DC and talk to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo over in Brussels as well. For the market, about four minutes in, we're down by three quarters of 1% on the SP 500. Bottom of the pile, information technology, negative 1.2% for that sector. The energy, that industry group, down by, up rather, by two-tenths of 1%. That's the price action. Let's get you some moves as well. Let's get to Abby. Hey, John. Well, another macro factor influencing markets today beyond the geopolitical tensions, earnings. We have the shares of NVIDIA plunging the most in more than a year after they put up basically a lackluster quarter and guidance. Investors not impressed after rising about 30 percent into that. Palantir also plunging a weak quarter in outlook. The operating margin missed. DoorDash, on the other hand, higher record number of orders, 35 percent increase year over year as pandemic dining habits uh, continue. And Walmart, the big one, up 1.4 percent, a very clean quarter top and bottom line. Importantly, relative Relative to supply chain issues, uh, their cost of goods rose just fractionally. In addition, they built up enough inventories to hedge against uh, rising uh, company costs and then the supply chain costs above estimates but offset by uh, some of the COVID easing in January, John. But Walmart is an early winner despite uh, these geopolitical tensions. I should note, though, off the highs, and that could reflect those geopolitical tensions. Abby, thank you. Patiently standing by, Peter Chair, Laurie Calvacina, and Jim Caron. Peter Chair. I wanted to come to you on the Federal Reserve as well and to talk about how all of this would influence the Fed's next move. Can I get your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think whether we get 25 or 50 is up in the air, I could see it going either way. But I do think they're actually going to be fairly slow to move on the rate hiking side. They're going to want to give it time to see how it plays out. And I do think they keep mentioning the balance sheet reduction. 
And people seem to be dismissing it a little bit. I think that's going to be the big shock really to the system. And that's where you might see some stress on valuations is if they really do proceed to aggressively move that balance sheet down, not just with runoff on the treasury side, but actually selling some mortgage backed securities. I don't think that is fully priced in yet. And that's one reason I think we keep seeing these you know, huge gaps in valuations on these stocks you just, <laughs> that you just announced, all these large cap stocks moving 10%. Some of that's this fear of what does the world look like once we actually start seeing the Fed drain its balance sheet. So I think that's actually within a month or two going to be the bigger topic of conversation. People will pull back on this five, six, seven rate hike, focus a little bit more on short term um, and then that balance sheet reduction. And Russia does play into this. I think we have to watch it very carefully. It will be disruptive to oil prices. So you can see that part being inflationary. But I think it's far more disruptive to the global economy. As we put in shank sanctions, that's going to hurt things. So I think the Fed will have to be very, very cautious in their rate hikes if Russia does do this limited incursion. Pete, just on balance sheet reduction, where do you land on size? Bank of America have come out with some massive numbers. Mark Cabana was talking about $1 trillion reduction this year, another $1 trillion next year. Where do the numbers come from? What's guiding you? Yeah. So we're coming out to something similar that we think they go from almost $8 trillion to $5.5 trillion by the end of 2024. They, if they just start in June, Treasury runoff this year is about $500 billion, $800 billion each of the next two years. So you, you get a lot of that number just by letting Treasuries run off. If you do the mortgage runoff and some other assets, you get to that pretty quickly. And I think that's going to be the scale of this. Looking at the equity side of things, Laurie, your three buckets, cyclicals, secular growth, defensives. Amidst this conversation, what's guiding you to one over the other versus the other? So look, our call for this year has been we wanted to be more oriented to the cyclicals in the, in the first part of the year and pivot back to secular growth later in the year. Um, and if you think about, you know, sort of what we're going through right now, this crisis in Ukraine, oddly enough, um, is sort of stoking that cyclical side because we have commodity exposure there, which are one of the direct beneficiaries of the tensions. Um, we also have, you know, a, a pretty nice, you know, sort of trajectory in financials right now. Interest rates are still rising. They typically do well ahead of the first Fed rate hikes. They lost their valuation appeal briefly but now they're cheap again so we're still riding our cyclical out our cyclical overweights for now we do think there will be a time to get off those but we're not there quite yet um we actually frankly john we left our tech overweight on um, and I, I stress that's not communication services that's not internet names but looking at classic sort of semis hardware software we think you've pulled a lot of the valuation froth out, perhaps not all, but we are getting pretty darn close to pre-pandemic levels when we look at expensive stocks relative to cheap stocks. Um, and we also think you have to keep in mind what's the bigger picture risk here from this more aggressive Fed, and it's the idea that it will cool the economy off. And typically when you see the economy transition from hot or above average back down to average type levels, that's when you want to move back into secular growth. So we feel like we are set up for a very, very choppy year. Frankly, I worry that the timetable is being accelerated just because the challenges to growth do seem bigger than they did at the start of the year. So the idea that we may get closer to that average trajectory, I think that timetable is getting pulled up and actually ends up proving the case for growth after you beat the heck out of them. Jim Karen, I know that's a message that resonates with you. Everything that Laurie just said on growth, Laurie's looking towards the back end of this year. You're very focused on 2023. What are you focused on right now, Jim, on 2023? So look, I mean, I think that we have to take this thing in steps. And, and right now, we're in a position where fixed income is a very, very challenged asset class because interest rates are rising. We have the perfect storm of inflation that's going up and a policy that's being changed right now towards towards higher interest rates. But as we start to step through this, the first things that we can do is we can look at what sectors of the fixed income markets that are actually performing reasonably well. And those two sectors would be bank loans and also emerging markets local debt. Both have you know reasonably high yields, and you know whereas emerging market local debt is really a value proposition, you know bank loans are something that's going to give you some income and also protect you against high higher rates. As long as growth stays reasonably good, we don't expect there to be a very very big default cycle. So I still think that these are are viable. The point here though is that as we look towards. 2023, the value sector, the EM local debt side, I think is going to be one of the best performing asset classes within fixed income. It's got a lot of ground to make up. It has some of the highest real yields. Um, it's got some of the best yields relative to credit rating and relative to duration. And many of the EM central banks have already hiked rates a lot last last year. So they're later in their in their overall cycle. At some point, though, we are going to price in all of these rate hikes. Inflation is going to peak. It's going to start to roll over. And then I think there can be a rotation into more traditional high yield and even into some of the investment grade uh, assets as well. 
But we do expect, at least in the near term, there's going to be some volatility, and I think you're going to get some buying opportunities. So while it's stressful right now, we do think that there is a nice buying opportunity that's brewing. It's sometime in March or April, as far as I can time it, and I think that's when I think that's when to do it. Well, I hope that you'll give us the call first, Jim, and we can catch up. Peter Chair, before you go, I wanted to give you the final word. For those in the audience that missed your introduction a little bit earlier, your company, Academy Securities, at the intersection between geopolitics and markets, you're surrounded at the firm by veterans, by former generals. Pete, can you tell me what you'll look through, look for through the rest of today, with Secretary Blinken coming up in about 20 minutes' time? I think it's us pushing back on Russia and by announcing this intention to do the false flag, that Putin wants a pretext. He wants to be able to take that Donbass region and get away with it. He wants to be able to say, I helped the Russian people. They provoked me. I went in. I'm only doing something that the people in that region want. Please forgive me. Let's start fresh negotiations now that I control this region. So that's what I think he really wants. So we are pushing back. And by the more we can push back on things like highlighting false flag motives, it will be more difficult for him to take that step because there will be far more pushback, despite Europe's desperate need for his energy. If it becomes very clear he's violated these people, this region, in a way that everyone becomes so uncomfortable with, that's when we will have that longer-term friction. And I think we've been doing a good job in this information warfare, right? There is as much information warfare as real warfare going on. And having said that, I think he has no interest in pushing in Kiev. And one of our generals pointed out just the other day that I think is really interesting, the Soviet Union and the U.S. actually never exchanged fire. So it's fairly unrealistic to think that he wants to do anything that puts U.S. citizens at risk, which would happen if he goes after Kiev. So I think keep this very focused on that Donbass region and figure out what that's going to mean. And part of that means to me that there are paths to, even if he gets his incursion, gets what he wants, that markets would get royal briefly. But if we can get some settlement, life moves on, unfortunately, for the people in Ukraine, but probably good for the global economy. Peter Chair, wonderful, as always, to catch up with you, with Jim Carrington and Laurie Calvacina on this market, working through some big issues globally into the opening bound and coming out the other side with equities just down, just down a little bit. After hearing from the President of the United States saying the probability of a Russian invasion is, quote, very high. It's very high. Why? Why? It's very high because they have not, they have not moved any of their troops out. They've moved more troops in, number one. Number two, we have reason to believe that they are engaged in a false flag operation. They have an excuse to go in. Every indication we have is they're prepared to go into Ukraine, attack Ukraine. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Because they have not, they have not moved any of their troops out. They've moved more troops in. Number one, number two, we have reason to believe that they are engaged in a false flag operation. They have an excuse to go in. Every indication we have is they're prepared to go into Ukraine, attack Ukraine. The President of the United States just moments ago, back with us, Maria Tadeo from Brussels, down in D.C., Bloomberg's Anne Marie, Anne Marie, Secretary Blinken. 15 minutes away. Yeah, we're reading those remarks from the U.S. Secretary Tony Blinken. Jonathan, as you say, he was on his way to Europe. That was supposed to be the plan today. But he's making this last-ditch stop in New York to address the U.N. Security Council and the UN, uh, U.S. Ambassador to United Nations, saying this is why. Because what they see, uh, their words, an imminent invasion potentially in Ukraine from Russia, this is why they want to spare no diplomatic potential of olive branch to ease these tensions. Jonathan, I think it's important. We just heard from the president. President. But prior to the president speaking, we should look at the timeline. Last night, a U.S. official briefed reporters saying that what Russia said in terms of withdrawal was false, and they've actually added 7,000 troops, that 150,000 they had already put amassing around the Ukraine border. Then you have the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, at the NATO HQ in Brussels, where Maria is, and he is saying that they're seeing troops inch closer more combat and support aircraft, as well as stocking up on blood supplies. And he says 
you don't do this for no reason, and you certainly don't do them if you're getting ready for a pullback. So, Jonathan, there is a slew of U.S. officials coming out talking about and really ramping up the tension right now, and that is going to culminate with Tony Blinken at the U.N. But we should note, Russia has sent their response to the United States, and they say they have no plans for an invasion, and they want to talk about security proposals. That's the story so far. Really strong language from the United States. Russia denying any plans to invade Ukraine. Maria, we have to talk about Ukraine. What are the Ukrainians saying? Well, look, Jonathan, every official that I've spoken with today in Brussels have told me that they are 100% focused on the situation overnight that happened in eastern Ukraine, where there are reports, again, a lot of this needs to be verified, the, and, and it has to be independently checked, but there are reports which they're taking very seriously that a school was shelled overnight. Now, the concern here, of course, is that this is an area where it is very sensitive. Of course, we do see Ukrainian forces fighting with Russian-backed separatists, and they fear that any Thing in the next 48 hours that happens in that area could lead to potential escalation. If there's a military situation that happens in the Donbass area, if there is a military confrontation for the Europeans, that means is the end of the diplomatic way. That means that the Minsk deal, the Minsk accord, you cannot carry that through. And essentially, you're looking at a situation that looks very much like the scenario that the European Union really fears, which is fighting again in eastern Ukraine in a way that is much bigger on a scale compared to the year war that we've seen over the past uh, years. Of course, I will tell you this fighting is normal at times in eastern Ukraine, but the timing of this is very suspicious for the Europeans. Throughout those negotiations, I've told Vladimir Putin, escalation is not compatible with dialogue. We don't want to see anything happening in East Ukraine. This is a very hot point. It's a very tense situation. Do not do anything in eastern Ukraine. So they really are monitoring the situation that happened overnight, and they want to see specifically who fired what and what happened. We've just heard from the Ukrainian foreign minister Minister who's just spoken to the British counterpart Liz Truss. They discussed the recent escalation. The Ukrainian foreign minister saying we spend no diplomatic effort to achieve peace. Anne Marie, 15, 10 minutes away. Secretary Blinken, just a final word from you. What you'll look for from the Secretary of State as he comes to New York and gets ready to go to Munich. He's coming to New York and he's going to be joining a number of individuals from the administration in Munich and in Europe. We should also note the vice president of the United States is also heading to this Munich Security Council. You could see the effort, Jonathan, from the administration to try to reach a diplomatic path for this. And my question really, or what I'm going to be looking for from Secretary Antony Blinken, is if the U.S. says this is going to be imminent and the Russians say they have no plans... What is the public face-saving off-ramp that the United States can now offer President Vladimir Putin, given the position he is at the moment? Anne-Marie, important final words. AMH down in D.C. Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Fantastic team coverage. 21 minutes into this session. Equities pulled back by more than 1% on the S&P 500. A bit into the bond market. These jitters filter through Treasuries. Yield to lower by seven basis points to a break of 197 on two. Sub 150 at 148. Yields down at the front end of the curve by three basis points. With your sector price action, Here's Kriti Gupta. Well, good morning, John. Like you said, red on the screen. A lot of it driven by big tech, specifically NVIDIA, is going to be your biggest weight on the S&P 500 after earnings that were actually pretty good, but investors' lofty expectations essentially weighing on that stock and therefore the index broadly. Uh, to the upside, your one sole sector here is going to be energy. What's interesting, John, is that energy prices are actually lower today. Oil is lower today on the possibility of potentially more Iranian barrels on the market. Nevertheless, the underlying physical market is saying that demand is going to get higher and higher dated Brent barrels going to $100 a barrel. Once again, that's not the spot price. That is the dated Brent in the physical market. That's what's driving up the energy stocks in particular. Nevertheless, the other mover in this market is going to be Walmart after some pretty blockbuster earnings, one of your major index contributors to the upside. But of course, no competition when it comes to those big tech names. Pretty thank you. Pretty good on the latest sector price action. Tons to work through. Whipsawed by headline after headline. This equity market Heading lower. Up next on the program, we'll get to the trading diary from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg.
25 minutes into the session, this market whipsawed by headlines. Yesterday it was the Fed minutes. We were down nine tenths of one percent. We finished the session higher by almost a tenth of one percent. Now we get taken lower by geopolitics, stuck between claims and counterclaims, disputes between the United States and Russia and Ukraine, trying to offer some guidance on a path forwards here. The next stop for this market, sectorally blinking, moments away. Equities down by more than one percent on the S&P 500, the Russell, the Nasdaq. Your bond market has a bid. Yields drift lower, down by seven basis points on ten to 197 on two sub 150 we were north of 160 a week ago right now 148 68 yields head south by three basis points on the front end of the curve that's the price action here's your trading diary secretary blinken moments away at the UN here in New York at the top of the hour. We'll take that for you and bring you the headlines. The St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard speaking at 11 Eastern. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mesta later in the day. The President discussing infrastructure at 12.15. More Fed speak to close out the week with Evans, Waller, Williams and Brainerd all on deck. And finally, the New York Stock Exchange will be closed on Monday for President's Day. From New York City, this was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.